Yeah. No. No, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, no, I know the stream's already started. <laughs> I'm, headed there, I'm headed right there now. Why else would I be in these casual pants and uh, no shoes? Because I'm in my own place. Where... Yeah, no, no, it does sound a little bit different because uh, we're just, uh, <laughs> we're in that elevator we just installed. I think it's going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm headed to check out uh, our uh, Chernobyl sarcophagus number three. Yeah, we're trying to outbid GE to get it instead. No, 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 no. Once we uh, start the stream, we'll be talking to uh, a bunch of dweebazoids about Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them I said that, though. It's but yeah, no, I mean, if they could see my whole body and my feet right now, <laughs> if there was any video equipment in this elevator, it would be pretty... Yeah, I guess I just... Yeet. Oh, don't worry about me. I didn't come from anywhere talking to anyone about anything. Hello and welcome to Office Hours, the live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors, as you just saw, and lets any old member of the general public, including my beloved facility staff, ask any old science pop culture uh, physics-y, engineering -y kind of question. As we're talking about that, taking live all your comments, questions, corrections, and comments about my body and face, we'll also be going through a number of topics, of course, as we do on every office hours. We'll be talking about what's going on at Chernobyl. Hint, it's not good. We'll also be talking, uh, if we get to it, about some of your comments from the latest episode of The Facility and a new study about cats. And if you know me, you know I love cats. You know what else I love? If you really, really, really want to get me to see something, you can, of course, use Super Chat on YouTube as you're seeing all the simps simping for science right here doing. I can't promise I get to every one of your donations and your comments and your questions, but I'll do my very best. And, of course, if you want to continue on this conversation after we do all this live, the video will be back up on the channel, and you can join the facility, patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. And if, <laughs> if you support us just enough, you get a, a see-through cup. So that's pretty cool. As an example of being pretty cool, I mean, Elizabeth Calvert, as always, with the $50 donation with her tiny human, Alex, who says, why are some meteors made of different kinds of metal? Well, Alex, I know you're only seven years old, but uh, different stuff forms in the universe because there's a lot of dust and, and gas and rocks, little little tiny pebbles of stuff floating all around the universe. Um, and that's what happens when things smash into each other in space, when stars die and explode in space. And over time, over millions and millions and billions of years, gravity brings all these things together and they accrete. The word is accrete, to bring together and to kind of glom onto like you're playing with Play-Doh. And that forms a different stuff uh, in the universe from uh, gas clouds, nebulas, eventually stars, eventually planets, that kind of thing. Laser crow, laser cow with a 10. Let's not get too crazy here. we got to talk about uh, Chernobyl. It's probably not cool to make it sound like that. Um... Show the love. Hey, Kyle, what is your idea on the basilisk? As it's, what's your overall opinion on the possibility of the basilisk, Roko's basilisk, and do you believe that it's actually dangerous? No, I don't. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to happen. There's a lot of uh, singularity enthusiasts who believe that um, monster AI is coming to enslave us, but I haven't seen any great evidence for that. Feral Beast says, in the words of Mugatu, Chernobyl, it's so hot right now. You nailed it. You nailed it so hard, we're going right to it. So, like, I, did you like my elevator? I just had it installed. Pretty cool, right? Right. Come on, you gotta tell me it was pretty cool, right? Let me let me check. Let me check the chat. It's pretty cool, right? Ugh! Nobody's saying nothing. How dare you? Anyway, as I say in the title and the not clickbaity, Warren clickbaity thumbnail. Something is going on at Chernobyl. You are looking at Chernobyl here. You're looking at a, a steel and metal... Sar yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. Steel and metal sarcophagus that was placed over after the Chernobyl reactor number four melted down. <laughs> um, Chernobyl reactor number four, 1986, melted down. And what happened during that meltdown was that 95% of the fuel 
in Chernobyl reactor number four melted um, by flinging neutrons at itself. It wasn't being cooled down with water. Um, there was a steam explosion that vaporized all the water and threw a two million kilogram lid or pound lid, I forget up off the top of the facility like it was a paperweight and all the water everything that cooled down the fuel went away and without any of this cooling the fuel got so hot that it became uh iridescent not iridescent it itself illuminated it became uh, it got so hot that it was glowing and this melted down into radioactive lava we call this radioactive lava corium corium has only been created five times outside of a laboratory setting um Three times at Fukushima, one time at Three Mile Island, and one time at Chernobyl, beneath reactor number four. So beneath reactor number four was tons and tons, 170 tons of irradiated uranium. 95% of the original fuel in the reactor melted down into the basement. It ate through concrete, sand, dirt, all this stuff. This is many thousands of degrees radioactive lava. Now, once this happened, of course, it's so radioactive that can't, you can't just go down into the basement, in, into the rest of these um, chambers and things where all the lava went, and clear it out. You would die. Within seconds, literally seconds, you would get um, a lethal dose of radiation if you were hands-on with some of this stuff. And so what they did instead was cacophon it cocoon it in a cacophon to prevent the cacophony of neutrons from flying out. Um, but what they did literally is, so instead of going in and removing all the fuel because they couldn't because you would die, they placed a giant steel and concrete sarcophagus on top of it. And then uh, many years later, they placed an even larger sarcophagus over the top of it. Now, this in theory keeps radiation fission products, radioactive dust, which is much more dangerous than you think because it sticks to everything, from getting out into the surrounding atmosphere. And at the time when fires were raging um, at Chernobyl, I think the fires raged for over a week or almost a week, it spread radioactive material across all of Europe, like a uh, debris spread the size of countries. So this was incredibly the worst accident in nuclear history. So they place this large sarcophagus over it to make sure nothing like that happens again. And they go in, as you can see, there's people inside of the sarcophagus. They go in and they monitor this still radioactive fuel that is still inside the slowly beating heart of failed Chernobyl reactor number four. Now, I didn't know a lot of this stuff. Um that I'm about to tell you, so it's interesting to me because, as you know, I'm fascinated by nuclear disasters. Uh, I make many documentaries about them. But there, there have been many problems with this containment over the years. Uh, one of the first ones is 1990. Um, in 1990, June of 1990, a, uh, a downpour of rain came down on top of the sarcophagus and it got eventually down to where all this fuel was. And the problem with putting uh, water on radioactive fuel or radioactive material, fuel containing material, FCMs they call it, you think it would, it would be good. It's like throwing water on a fire, right? Wrong. It's not just about cooling the fuel. Water also acts as a so-called moderator for radioactive material. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can check out the last uh, Half-Life History mini-documentary that we did. But to put it simply, a not all neutrons, which is the stuff that flies out from radioactive material, the, the particles that fly out, not all neutrons are great for continuing on nuclear chain reactions. Um, there are two kinds of neutrons that fly out. There are delayed neutrons that come out a second or two later after a fission event, a large nucle unstable nucleus splits. And they're so-called prompt neutrons, neutrons that come out within like the first trillionth of a second. They come out, they're screaming out of this fission event. They're going really, really fast. And it turns out that these really, really fast high energy neutrons 
are not as good at continuing on nuclear chain reactions. I don't know if this is wholly accurate as an analogy, but I like to think of it like, you know, if you had a group of billiard balls or pool balls together and you wanted to hit one ball into another, like crack, 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 your chances of getting a good hit where you want to go is easier when it's a slower controlled hit, like lining it up, crack. But if you were to come and put a, a, <laughs> a, if you were to hit, shoot one of those balls with a gun, bam, and you, and you really fly this billiard ball at another billiard ball, it might not hit, it might miss, it might get destroyed. This is kind of what's happening with nuclear reactions. So when the neutrons are too high energy, when they're prompt, it doesn't work. So water getting in the way of these prompt neutrons as they fly out can act as a moderator. It slows them down. And by slowing down neutrons in a, in a nuclear fission reaction, it increases the number of neutrons that are available to, conti to continue on these chain reactions. Now back to Chernobyl. Can't you imagine how it would be bad if you had 170 tons of nuclear fuel, lava, cooled nuclear lava, and you poured a bunch of water on it? And if that water started acting like a moderator for the still radioactive material then nuclear chain reactions could continue again. And so in 1990, June of 1990, a so-called stalker scientist, which I got to do a whole video on these guys, a scientist at Chernobyl who risked radiation exposure, he ran into this, facility, this, this destroyed apparatus and sprayed it with a solution of uh, a nitrate solution which absorbs neutrons. So they had to, because the water was pouring on this uh, nuclear fuel, they ran in, they sprayed it to make sure that neutrons were being absorbed and not moderated so that nothing would go critical. Now, keep in mind, if there's a criticality risk, that means within a few fractions of a second, milliseconds, if everything is in the right orientation, if there's uh, the right number of neutrons, they, maybe they're reflected just the right way by by the by the uh, by the room and the uh, geometry of the room. This releases an enormous amount of material uh, of energy. It's live, really, 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 really quickly. It's effectively an explosion. It would vaporize the. It's like a nuclear explosion. It would vaporize the fuel. It could send fuel out again. It could destroy the rickety old apparatus, um, the old 1986 infrastructure here. It would be a, another disaster, and we want to prevent that. Now, the stalker running in and spraying down fuel, risking his own life. That was in 1990. Now fast forward 31 years to today, and Chernobyl is not done. Today, they are now getting readings that the neutron emissions are again creeping up. Now, you wouldn't expect this to happen if everything was under control, right? As radioactive material decays, you would expect the number of neutrons, fission events to go down, 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 down. But some spots are going up, and that's bad. Like we said, runaway nuclear reaction can cause another explosion. Um, and one of these, well, a lot of these areas, the problem being is that a lot of these areas are completely inaccessible to people. Either they can't get there physically, or they can't get there based on radiation uh, concerns, and so they would die. So right now, they are monitoring increased fission events inside of the still beating heart of Chernobyl. And why I wanted to highlight this was uh, they gave a, an update about the elephant's foot. So if you know me, you know, I've done a lot of material about the elephant's foot and it's uh, been fascinating me for years. And unless you do primary research, research, like talk to Russian scientists or go to Russia, it's very hard to find primary sources about the elephant's foot. Trust me. Um, and so there was actually in this uh, science article I'm reading here, um, there was an update on the elephant's foot, which I hadn't heard of. When the elephant's foot, which was one of these large masses of radioactive lava that burned through the floor and um, burned through the floor and solidified, 
it looked like this wrinkly gray mass looks like a large elephant's foot um it was incredibly incredibly radioactive and when it first cooled it was so hard that to get a chunk off of it for analysis the russians being russian fired an ak-47 at it (laughs) because of course they did maybe that's just what they had on hand who knows you don't want to get near it you need to snap a chunk off of it fire an ak-47 at some radioactive lava just a normal day in russia okay um the update being is that now 40 years later Reportedly, according to this article on on this on on these uh, ongoing events, the elephant's foot now has the consistency of sand. So it's not this large mass anymore. Rather, it's this um, pile of radioactive sand and material. And again, that gives you some kind of sense of, like that's good. Like this radioactive material is deteriorating. But again, if there are if there's another excursion event, if there's another criticality accident because of these um, these neutrons suddenly spiking up in certain areas, radioactive sand is much, much worse than a hunk of radioactive material because sand, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's granular. It can get everywhere. It's like radioactive dust. Um, it can get in your lungs, on your clothes, on plants. It can be up, uh, uptaken in the environment by plants uh, and other animals. So radioactive sand is really bad. Now, I do not have a, a finish. I, do, I don't have a conclusion to this story. <laughs> All that we know right now is that neutron fission, uh, fission events spewing neutrons are ticking up. In, uh, I was supposed to sound like a Geiger counter, but it really didn't. Are ticking up in certain areas. So what do we do? Um, There isn't a whole lot to do. With so much containment, it's not like you put on another container on top of a container on top of a container. Um, But other other governments and organizations are watching this situation very closely because similar things happen at a place like Fukushima, which had three meltdowns and Corium created three separate times. And so being so close to the ocean, Fukushima is, and still dealing with masses of radioactive fuel, they're looking at this Chernobyl situation being like, oh no, (laughs) how are you going to deal with this if there are more events or there could be more events? Um, We don't know yet. And so, the legacy of the world's worst nuclear disaster lives on. Now, I, I have been talking in a very somber, creepy way about Chernobyl, um, but I will point out as I think I I should, that even though this is the worst nuclear accident in human history, even though it irradiated a lot of people in Europe, still, even with all that, nuclear energy is by and large the safest energy that we have. But Kyle, how could, but Chernobyl's scary and all the radiation and all, I know. I know. But that's only because, like Hmm. Like radiation is invisible to you, what, uh, what, what, what more natural fuel sources, what fossil fuels has been doing to you and your society and your civilization has been similarly invisible? We don't think about what fossil fuels have been doing to the environment and to you. But it's so much worse. The amount of pollution every year from fossil fuels 3,000 people in China are dying every day. Think about that. At its worst, wasn't uh, COVID-19 killing about 3,000 people a day in the United States? Think about that happening every single day for, what, 50 years or 75 years or since the Industrial Revolution. That's what fossil fuels have been doing. By contrast, nuclear power, yes, though it... Though it be scary, though this is a creepy looking thing, though radiation is... The number of deaths associated, number of damages associated with nuclear power is, in comparison, negligible. Kyle, that sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Really. You're talking about 
three orders of magnitude difference. Easy. Easy. If 90 people have died in the last, you know, if 90 people die per terawatt hour of, of, uh, of nuclear energy, then it's like 90,000 people for fossil fuel. So it is like a threefold, um, a three order of magnitude increase. So my conclusion is let's make more of these. <laughs> Uh, Santiago Ardia with a COP 40,000. Who? Hey, Kyle, two questions. Did you play Resident Evil 8? Yes, I'm playing it right now. Second question. If you could change one thing about anything on the planet, what would it be? Um, one thing about anything on the planet. I'd like to, I'd, I would like to still see dinosaurs. I would love to see some dinosaurs. Joe Boone with a 20 says, here's money. Thanks for the videos. You got it, buddy. Corday with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, thanks for rekindling my interest in science and reminding me that learning isn't just a young man's game. Darn tootin'. It's been humbling seeing just how much I've learned since I started following you. I love that, and I love you by extension. Not like that. I love your brain. Majorly awesome. Oh, I get it. Majorly awesome. Your army buddies must think you're hilarious. With the 20, who says, Able to catch the live show again. Love what and why you do it. By the way, any advice on how to engineer my flood spore samples to make everyone into sweet boys? What? Oh, did you get spore samples from the flood, like the Halo alien, and you want to make everyone into sweet boys? First of all, stop making me say sweet boys. Second of all, yeah. Just... Let's talk later about it. William Bauer with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, love the show. Do you believe that nuclear hazards are any different than the hazards we ex we ex we accept every day? Or is it the boogeyman, like the way it's portrayed? Um, yes, nuclear power definitely has um, bad press. It is definitely a boogeyman. It's a, it's a NIMBY, as engineers would call it. Not in my backyard situation. Um, though it is very safe, the safest form of energy we have... Um, yeah, it, it, it has bad press because of these high-profile disasters. Um, but it's like flying. I mean, people are afraid of flying, um, even though it's the safest form of travel. I mean, there was a year, was it 2017, 2018, where not a single person died on, an air, on a commercial aircraft. Um, so there's a, there's a public perception problem with nuclear power um, that it has to get around. Um, for widespread acceptance, and I don't know how to do that. I'm working on it. Cheech Ola, with the Australian $31, says, Good night, Kyle. You mentioned a radiation-eating fungus, radiotrophic, they call it. Radiotrophic fung fungus in an office hours a while back. Can't we chuck those bad boys into a place like Chernobyl to clean it up? Seems like they love it there. Cheers, you absolute legend. <laughs> um... I think we know we found the radiotrophic fungi, fungi around Chernobyl. And if you're not familiar, radiotrophic meaning that they use radioactive processes. They use particles flying out from radioactive material to generate energy. It's the same kind of way that photosynthesis works, where photons coming in from the sun um, uh, impact certain chem uh, impact certain atoms and molecules, break them apart, create energy for the organism. These fungi are using radiation from Chernobyl or from uh, radioactive material in the same way. In, in, it's kind of the same thing, except instead of photons, they're using particles from fission events. Um, now, I don't know if you could cultivate and throw a bunch of them. Just, oh, there's so many people. I'll, I'll get, I'll get to you. I'll get to you. I'll try. Um, I don't know how easy it would be to cultivate it in mass to throw on top of Chernobyl. Although, what I did see a year ago or something like that, um, NASA was looking, or some other space organization, was looking into radiotrophic fungi as a way to shield astronauts from cosmic radiation during space travel. So, um, cosmic radiation would be a huge problem for people during uh, prolonged space missions without shielding. Shielding is heavy. Shielding is expensive. If it's lead, too heavy. If it's water, very, very heavy, not as expensive. But if it's if it's a thin mat of radiotrophic fungus, the fungus could grow, and then at a certain uh, depth, hopefully it would provide enough protection from the radiation. They were looking into that. Luke Gomillion, whew, talking a lot, with a 10, says, Hey Kyle, love watching your channel. I'm glad I caught my first live stream. 
Need it after bombing my calculus test. <laughs> Hashtag simp for science. Calculus is hard, man. I took calc 1, 2, 3, 4, and differential equations. It's it's not easy um, being cheesy. But uh, engineering is hard, you know? What I did to make sure that I was studying, I love looking at people and... Oh, that's a weird... Hey, look at the thing on the back of her neck. That's weird. <laughs> Um, so I sat at the front of every class, the, the very front, so that I'd never be distracted. I'm always at the front. I always take great notes. Um, that helped me. Minimize your distractions in your environment so you can focus on the task at hand. And maybe you won't bomb next time. But, who knows? I don't know you. Pitchforks with a 10. So speaking of climate change, would you ever do a video on the cath rate gun, clath rate gun hypothesis? Or is it too scary for people? Well, it does sound like something that I wouldn't want put on my body by the doctor. So I'll look into that. I don't know what it is. Chris Goff, Groff, Chris Groff with the 20. I was legitimately sad when they shut down Oyster Creek nuclear plant here in New Jersey. I hope it eventually gets replaced. We need more nuclear power plants. Not just more, but bigger ones. No, that's not true. Smaller ones. Um, nuclear technology is progressing every single day. Um, reactors are getting safer, smaller. We're looking into different materials like thorium, which are which can be reused, which can't be weaponized into nuclear bombs. Um, shutdown mechanisms are safer. The, one of the other problems with bad press is that all the nuclear power plants, especially in, in the United States, are super old. It takes a long time to build them. It takes a long time to take them down. I mean, it takes like 10 years to decommission a power plant. Um... So if, if the public got more behind nuclear power, then the technology would follow and it would get cooler and better and safer. Make me, make me a nuclear spokesman. Gorf with a Canadian $10 says, do you, have you read Bill Gates's plan for a complete redesign of nuclear power plants? It's revolutionary and uses the waste materials from current plants. Yeah, I think that might be thorium kind of stuff like we were talking about marvello mavo with a 10 says i just found out that all the kevins are clones based on elizabeth little one's dna and use the accelerate oh <laughs> and use the accelerated growth microwave from rick and morty don't don't clone elizabeth's son against their will bioethics it's an interesting uh it's an interesting thing right think about what well when you, when you genetically engineer a fetus, yes, this is, if you're just joining us, this is a weird sentence to join in. But if you're genetically engineering a fetus, we could right now do weird stuff to it. I, <laughs> Kyle, you're not making me feel any better. I know. But we could do, we could change eye colors. We could probably change its sex. Um, we could do weird stuff. We don't do weird stuff. Um, we could, we could, we could filter out genetic disorders, that kind of thing. We don't do that stuff because it's a very, very tricky bioethical question. Because when you are altering the DNA of a fetus or, or, or an embryo, um, that embryo obviously has no say in the matter. And altering that DNA at that point, if they went on to have kids, those kids would have the same genetic edits because they're using some of the parent's DNA, right? And so by altering DNA from the start, you are making a decision for possibly generations of people and that is why the question is so difficult uh liquid flames with the 20 says do the death comparisons include deaths for the following generations for example children born to women exposed by radioactive material people eating blah 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 blah, blah, blah. um yeah no people have uh kept pretty good track of all the um possible fatalities linked to chernobyl to fukushima and that kind of thing and yes still um, the, the number of associated deaths, like when I say order of magnitude, I don't know if you know what I mean. Order of magnitude means a tenfold increase. So right now, um, fossil fuels are killing people in three orders of magnitude difference, which is 10 times 10 times 10, which is a thousand. So for every associated death with every nuclear disaster, there's a thousand more people that are dying from pollution related fossil fuel stuff. Um, and so it's not even like, it's not even like 1% as bad. It's less than that. It's a hundredth of a percent as bad. No, it's a tenth of a percent as bad. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost not even comparable. Durandal with the $50 donation says, Hey Kyle, hey show, 
In my ever-present need to use science on things I probably shouldn't, I've run into an interesting question which I haven't seen anyone ask yet. In your opinion, what would be... What... Uh, in your opinion, would mana be closer to a particle or a wave? Well, I'm going to get biblical on you, and I'm going to say mana is closer to bread that falls from heaven. <laughs> I went to a lot of Catholic school. And I don't know why that's a... I mean, you know, you're talking to the guy who has, you know his own face on magic cards and stuff like that but that was the first thing that you made me think of so bringing me you're bringing me right back to to childhood there grin reaper the 19 says we've come a long way from taking reactor rods out by hand that was a great video by the way yes if you haven't seen our latest um, mini documentary the true story of america's first nuclear meltdown please check it out it's a tv show length Mini documentary, like 25 minutes, all talking about America's first nuclear meltdown. I think we did a pretty good job on it, if I do say so myself, which I do. Tom Parker with the 20 says, loved your video on SL1. Speak of the devil. Would you ever do a video on Adam Rickover and his influence on modern day nuclear power? Yeah, he was associated with the SL1 reactor, uh, the, the, the general, correct? Um... Let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get uh, to some peer review stuff. Uh, one of my security team, Jay, with 10, says, Hey, you should be resting right now. Jay is very injured, and you should stop doing things. Jay with the 10 says, Kyle Show, the love... Uh, real talk, boss. Neural networks and machine learning, net good or net evil, sorry I'm broken. It's okay. Look, you couldn't have stopped that car even if you tried. Um... Are neural network works a net good or a net Benny? <laughs> I don't know. Neural so uh, neural networks are a way to model. Uh, it, it's an information processing model that looks to how neurons, neural network, how neurons talk to each other, um, interconnected electrical signaling um, that can also moderate itself. So. Uh, it can weight signals from certain neurons. So certain neurons can be more important and some neurons can be less important. The The neural network can weight itself. So, you know, pay more attention to these signals and not as much attention to these signals. And in doing that, with a with a certain with a with enough nodes with enough neurons, you can get information processing systems that are incredibly complicated. Um, right now, the human brain, as far as we know, is the most complicated organic thing in the universe. And that's a neural network. So we, with computer learning, neural networks, we figure, are a, are a good way to start modeling and creating intelligence. It, it's, it's not necessarily the only way, but we're basing it on our own meat, our own head meat. Um, and like many technologies, whether it's a net good or a net benning, is hard to say. It depends on what it's going to be used for. I mean, the same technology that allows for incredible advances in nuclear power also enabled, you know, the atomic bomb. So it, it depends. Um, I don't think by itself it's, an, it's a net negative. Um, and I contrast that with something that, you know, I love to rail about. Um, let's pause the Super Chats again. I don't want to miss anybody. Um... You know I love to rail about social media. Social media as a technology I think is different because it is engineered in a way to take advantage of certain human proclivities, a certain way that your mind works, to incentivize people to be angry and loud um, and to have opinions they would never say to your face. So it it's baked into social media the badness of it. I don't think neural networks do that in the same way. Conk with the 50 says, Hey Kyle, greetings from the east of Australia. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to do an Australian accent. Greetings from the east of Austria. Just want to say thank you for all the great explanations in your videos. All hail the mighty Kyle. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Peer review. So as we're wont to do on every episode of Office Hours, I like to take 
some comments and questions from the latest episode of the facility and highlight them. I then give you a plaque. And you become uh, a staff member. <laughs> the last episode of the facility was, of course, the SL-1 disaster, America's first nuclear meltdown. And uh, it's a 25-minute 25 25-minute 25 video. Spent a lot of time on it. I really liked how it turned out. Watch it if you haven't seen it yet. But uh, let's go through a couple of your uh, learned comments Frosty Omnic says the man who was impaled to the ceiling makes this seem like a proper horror story. Imagine being the one of the firefighters to first realize what you were seeing. Honestly, these half-life histories need to win some form of award. Not sure what category exists for the Webbies or whatever, but the writing and effort Kyle puts into these deserves larger scale recognition. <laughs> I couldn't agree. Uh, actually, actually, uh, I'm going to give it to. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give this week's to, uh, Sergeant Kasi, who says, quote, uh, quoting me, the men didn't know it, but this minuscule moment, much faster than the blink of an eye, was the rest of their lives. Now, Kyle, I don't know how much effort you put into this line, but holy crap. Now, I wanted to highlight that because a lot of you may not, may not know this about me, but before I was doing video and nerdy crap, uh... <laughs> I was a science writer, and uh, what I thought I wanted to do was write science stories. And when you hear a great uh, line of dialogue or you read a great sentence, yeah, a lot of work does go into it. Not just for me, of course, just writers in general. But I wanted to highlight this because it I want to bring it to your attention that it's it's a very intentional thing the way you communicate with people, right? So right now, I'm being pretty casual. I'm saying crap, and I'm laughing, and blah, 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 blah. But when you listen to something like this, I'm obviously very somber and um, deliberate, and all my words are, are chosen pretty carefully, and the way that I pause, the way that I, the, my, my volume changes, all that stuff is all thought out, is all deliberate, and it's all a way to create the mood and the tone through which you transmit the information. And I want you all to think about that too. Um, especially when, you know, most of the conversation, most of the conversating, when most of the conversing you do is online right now. Think about, think about the context and the tone and the word choice of things because these things do really matter. They can create entirely different perceptions of what you're talking about what you mean and what you're trying to get across. Um, so for highlighting that little piece um, that I think is sometimes lost on some science communicators, uh, for highlighting that little piece, Sergeant Kase, you are now an honorary member of the facility. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now you get a plaque, and Kevin's going to give you a plaque. What? Why would it... Why would it be on the... Why would it... Why would it be on the elevator? Just a second. <sighs> I forgot what I was doing. I gotta go. <laughs> Hey, it's your boy, Kyle. Do you like video games? Do you like science? Do you like watching people play science video games? Well, just a sec, because your boy Kyle forgot to load in a graphic and... Hey, okay. Hey, do you like science? <laughs> do you like video games? Well... If you like any of that stuff, you are not going to want to miss our very first Scientist Plays stream, which we are doing for the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. We will be playing it on Twitch, Twitch TV, slash SciFile, my normal handle, uh, this Friday at 1.30 p.m. 
Pacific Standard Time, we'll start our stream of Mass Effect Legendary Edition, starting with Mass Effect 1, going as far as we possibly can. And during that time, we will be joined by Commander Shepard herself, Jennifer Hale. Um, Jennifer is a friend of mine. She's a uh, absolutely lovely person. And she's a science enthusiast, so you're not going to want to miss all the behind-the-scenes uh, commentary that she will have for that and all the sciencey stuff that we can comment on and share with you as we're playing through one of the best sci-fi video game series in history. You're not going to want to miss it. That's this Friday. If you want to go to Twitch TV, twitch.tv slash sci and follow right now for notifications on when we're going live... Uh, you should do that. And after the stream, a full cutdown highlight video of however long that stream is will go straight to the YouTube channel, so you are not going to miss it. And if you want me to be playing your favorite sci-fi game, make sure you are leaving those comments in the chat and in various places. We're not going just going to do Mass Effect. We're going to do many sciencey games in this series. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned. Well, yeah, I made it seem like I was going to the elevator, and then I forgot the other asset for the- Why didn't you have it preloaded? It's first grade stuff. Anyway. Nerdy Loki 44 with the Australian $20 says, Hey, love, show the coil. That's not Australian. EZO allows the Mass Effect universe to achieve FTL, or faster than light, space flight. Space flight. Would traveling at that speed have any effect on the time experienced by both crew and outside observers? The problem with traveling at or near the speed of light is that time dilation becomes a crazy thing. Um, and time dilation is the universe's way of making the speed of light consistent across reference frames. And so if you're going really fast and an outside observer is standing still, Unless time and space warps for you, you are both going to measure the speed of light differently. And so because the speed of light is just one of the things about our universe that is constant in a vacuum, space-time warps itself. And so di time dilation and length contraction are a thing. Um, and so if you're just traveling really fast, then... An outside observer would see your clock ticking more slowly, and when you stopped in that spaceship, the rest of the universe would have aged differently than you. And so if you're traveling fast enough, or for long enough, sci-fi stories start to break down because, you know, you can travel to Dagobah and back, and in that time you aged a week, but everyone else aged 20 years. That doesn't really make storytelling, uh, feasible storytelling and narrative arcs, right? Mass Effect and uh, Star Trek, those uh, kinds of sci-fi try to get around that with so-called warp drive, so that space is moving FTL, you're not. And so you do not have the same time dilation problems. Um, but I don't know how thought out that is in the Mass Effect universe, to be honest. James Hawkins, seven. Just found out last week about Windscale, aka Britain's Chernobyl. Won't be decommissioned till 2144 because of the radioactive rust. Yikes. Yeah, a lot of people were mentioning uh, on, on my Discord, a lot of people were mentioning the Windscale fire. I might have to look into that one. Crabby Cranberry. Does look like an angry little fruit, don't you? <laughs> if you teleported at the speed of light, when you reappeared in the atmosphere, wouldn't that cause a giant explosion? That's a lot of air being displaced very quickly. Well, you say it's a lot of air. The human, the, the human volume is not that much. Um, and you could do this. So let's do a little bit of math. And I'm, I'm working on an, an episode where we're, where I'm going to show you how to estimate anything. But estimate what the human volume is. The average human on Earth is 62 kilograms. That's including children and stuff. I know, I know you're probably heavier than that. <laughs> that's aggressive. I'm much heavier than that. But 62 kilograms is the average. Humans are much like water. Water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So... Knowing those two facts, um, you divide you d <laughs> you divide 62 kilograms by the density, which means you are dividing 62 by a thousand, which means you have point 
0.062 cubic meters. Which, a cubic meter is a lot, but, you know, less than a tenth of that is not that much. And so that much air popping into and out of existence from a vacuum, um, like if you were teleporting, uh, yeah, it would cause a bang. But I don't think it would cause a large explosion. Did you follow me on that one? Steel Gorilla with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, don't be scared, but there is a way to make crystals out of hum... But is there a way... Okay, don't be scared. Not a great way to start a sentence. But is there a way to make crystals out of human blood? If not, would fake blood help make a red crystal that embodies free-flowing blood? I.e. not a scab or dried blood. Okay, so you started You started and you said, don't be scared. And then you, you kept asking me about how to make blood crystals. Blood Diamond was a movie. I don't know if blood can crystallize. What's in it? Minerals. Why am I thinking about this? Stop it. You're a vampire, aren't you? I'm not going to make your vampire blood crystals. Don't trick me. You can't trick me. No one can trick me. Jamie, with the 20, says, First time donator, long time watcher. When I see reasons why people don't want to eat meat alternative, they always bring up how they are packed with estrogen. Your thought, hashtag simp for science, are they? They can't all be, right? I have in my facility freezer, which is enough to hold a couple of bodies, but there's no bodies in them. Crap. There's no bo- Inside my, f my facility fridge over there, I have some Impossible Burgers, and they're quite tasty. I don't think they're loaded with estrogen. Are they? Jennifer with the five says, My son was so proud and excited about you speaking about uh, autism spectrum disorder. He loves watching you and thinks and thinks like you as well. He is so happy now. Thank you, Kyle. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that with me. Uh, tell your son I said hello and that I don't know him, but he's probably pretty cool. Parker Brilliant. With the 999 says, late to the stream, and it's been a while since I was super chatted. You mentioned a science play series on Twitch. I was wondering the time frame. Would you possibly play my favorite game, FTL? That's a good example. Actually, good time. Uh, you got in just in time because we are playing Mass Effect with Commander Shepard herself, Jennifer Hale, this Friday on Twitch. And then it's getting posted to YouTube. But when it gets posted to YouTube, it's going to be all cut up and edited all cool and fancy. Um... Phytoestrogen does not equal estrogen in the way that you're thinking of it, says Blade Baca. Thank you. Uh, Antoine Papillion says, what's going on? Why, then why are you here? I'll tell you what's going on. Cats is what's going on, baby. Speaking of cats, I just watched the the, the recent theatrical release of Cats, and it is, it, it's so bad that it made me want to defund the arts. I should have recorded my reaction. It's so... So much to say about it. Anyway. Cats. If you know me, uh, you know I have many cats here at the facility. I have Chonkita. I also have the Distinguished Lady 3 Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. And they're lovely kitties. And what's lovely about cats, what's lovely, lovelyly odd about them, is that they like to sit... If they fits, they sits. And they like to sit in boxes, they like to be under things, they like to sit in, in, in enclosed areas. I'm... I, I don't know why. And scientists don't know why. One thing... One, one another, uh, another fun thing about cats in uh, the context of doing science with cats is that it's very difficult to do science with cats. Uh, as opposed to something like a dog, where you can train a dog to sit in an MRI, for example. You can train a dog to sit in an MRI, and they love it. Oh, dogs love MRIs. Can't get enough of it. Cats refuse to be tested in the same way. And I'm, if you have ever interacted with a cat or you own a cat, you know that they don't like doing what you want them to do. And so it's, it's hard if not impossible up until this point, to get a true scale or a true measure of intelligence of cats and the trainability of cats because they're only semi-domesticated and they refuse. But every so often, you can get some studies done with cats, and this one is no different that I'm referring to now. Uh, this study is called If I Fits, I Sits. Gabriella 
you are awesome for making that the title of your actual scientific paper. If it fits, I sit a citizen science investigation into the illusory contour susceptibility in domestic cats. And what this is going through is that, like you are seeing, Cats exhibit this behavior where not only will they sit in something like a, a square box, but even the contour of a box. You may have seen this on social media. If you just put down a square in tape, a lot of times your cat will go sit on it. Again, we don't know why. But what Gabriella Smith was trying to do was to see, was to probe into cat cognition. So this study was interesting in two ways. I think this is the first study of cat cognition in this way and visual perception. And it's one of the first uses of citizen science in this way. So because of uh, the pandemic, to get test subjects for this, she had to recruit people online and have her uh, have them send her videos of their cats exhibiting this behavior. What behavior, Kyle? Well, Gabriella wanted to probe visual perception of cats and more specifically, optical illusions. If an animal like you, you animal, is susceptible to an optical illusion that says something about the way that their brain works. Because if you can be fooled into thinking something is, but it isn't, or has the appearance of something, but it's not, that gives a scientist some idea, excuse me, sorry, some idea that your brain has models of the world that can change or your brain is predicting something about the world, and when that prediction doesn't match reality, that's the, the illusion part, right? So the classic example of this that you know is uh, a cube, one of the three-dimensional cubes. If you look at one of those three-dimensional cubes for long enough, you can get one edge to pop out, but then the other edge seems like it's popping out, and then it looks like it's that direction, but then that direction. This is because your brain has competing models for what, this should look like, and because it doesn't have enough information, it spontaneously flips b between the two. But Kyle, if your if your brain's always modeling everything in the environment based on previous models, doesn't that make reality as a whole kind of a lie? Yes, it does. But let's not get into that. So Gabriella Smith was trying to probe animal cognition in a similar way by presenting kitties with optical illusions. These optical illusions are called. I want to get it right. Kain, Kaisa? Kinesa squares. And so these Kinesa squares are trying to see if a brain will autocomplete a shape based on illusory contours. So you can see here that this does not make a square with its contours, correct? But if you flip the shapes this way, just these Pac-Man looking things will create an illusory square. There's no actual square. There's no lines on the ground. But your brain auto-completes this to make it look like a square in your brain. You think square when you see this Kinesa square here. And so Gabriella gave a number of cats uh, across the internet. There's a lot of cats on the internet. This test, a control, so same materials, but different orientation, control, and the optical illusion. Now, knowing, <laughs> it's not proven, again, it's not proven why, but because we know that cats have a tendency to sit in enclosed areas, squares on the ground, that kind of thing, the hypothesis is this. And this is going to sound weird, because most of the time, hypothesis means something different in a scientific paper, but... A scientific paper, you present a hypothesis and then you try to falsify it or not. So the hypothesis in this paper would be cats can experience optical illusions. Therefore, they will sit more often in the Kinesa square illusion. And then you find and then you, you get data on that and then you prove it or not. And this paper did, in fact, prove that. So oh, I have the paper up here somewhere. Whatever. So, in fact, cats, as compared to the control, did go and sit in the illusory square more often than the control square, which means that cats experience optical illusions like some other animals and like you do. And this gives us a hint at what their little kitty cat brains are doing on the inside. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us about their intelligence or anything like that, but 
it does mean that their inner lives are complicated in a way that we might assume but wasn't proven until now. And so if you really wanted to, you could start tricking your cat with optical illusions. Oh, there's also another, I'll try to find it here. There's another, both, both, uh, uh, both large cats and kitties. So, okay. So here it is. You'll, you'll, you'll see this. So, uh, it's been proven that both lions and kitty cats both react to the illusion I'm about to show you. So you react to this illusion. Ah, oh, it's a low, ah, oh, it's, ah, oh, it's so low quality. Ugh. Just, ugh. Why are, why are you doing it this way? Okay, okay, this is a good example. Okay, so, uh, here you go. This is known as the rotating snakes illusion. And because of so-called Mike from Seoul, I love, love South Korea. Thank you for, for joining us for the first live stream. So because of the way your peripheral vision is drifting, if you try to look at any of these one snakes, it will look like some of the snakes on the periphery start to move around. And it has been shown that lions and domestic cats both fall for this illusion. For this illusion. And what the cat will actually do is you put this piece of paper underneath their little peats and they will start swiping at the the snakes as though the snakes are moving. If you separated these out so that there was no illusion, you would not expect for them to have some prey reaction behavior. But they do because they see this optical illusion just like you do. And that means your cat is even more interesting than you thought he or she was. Or they. Kitty. Spartacus, and we're almost at the end, of our little facility stream here um and if you want even more facility style streaming stuff that's not the last stream we are doing this week this friday we'll be streaming the mass effect legendary edition series with commander shepherd herself jennifer hale on twitch stay tuned for that spartacus with a 10 says hey show love the kyle stop it Long time watcher, but first time simping for science. Well, I'm happy to have you, Spartacus. I'm Spartacus as well. Keep up the great work. Thank you for the great content. Uh, I'm just a guy. Justin Cho says five more from Seoul. What up, Kyle? What up, Justin? Thank you for being one of my favorite members of the facility. You weirdo. Just a couple more minutes. Uh, if anyone has anything else, uh, Casey Rouse says, oh, so I just arrived. What was that about Chernobyl? Oh, I said it wasn't that bad, but it's bad right now. <laughs> Michael Cooper says, why do the Egyptians have cats believe cats are gods? I don't know, man. A lot of, uh, every society throughout human history has a lot of weird beliefs a lot of, uh, about a lot of weird things. A lot of beliefs seem, seem like they're not weird today. That's only because they've been around for a thousand years or whatever. But if someone started today saying any of the stuff... That's in ancient belief systems. It would sound like... It would sound, well, well, aren't you supposed to be on Infowars or something? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, believing a cat is a god, if you're an Egyptian... I don't know. It's not... It's not. Uh, there's nothing to me that's weirder about that than any other belief system that's not empirically based. You know? Jay Twisted, with the 50, says, Hey Kyle, love the show. You see that? That's classy. They come in there... And they say the sentence right. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Office Hours. I'm sorry. If, I, if it looks like I'm looking all over the place, it's like there's a lot of optical illusions on my screen. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. We went through... Man, I didn't size it. We talked about Chernobyl and how it's beating hard is still, yes, beating, 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 beating underneath the floorboards like some sort of Edgar Allan Poe poem. Edgar Allan poem. Why has no one said that? before that's silly oh wait you know what i'm gonna try something out this might not go very well once it's that time again it's that time again it's that time again beloved staff Members of the general public, it's that time again. Thank you so much for joining me this week 
on office hours as I return to the surface to recapitulate my normal life as a mild-mannered sandwich maker. I implore you to have a wonderful rest of your week. If you want even more science, you can go back to the channel and watch the last episode at the facility where we're talking about America's first nuclear meltdown. You can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill to join the facility to help me speak and to continue on this conversation even after everything here is over. And if you want more streaming, you can go to uh, twitch.tv slash sci to get ready for our first Scientist Plays series playing Mass Effect Legendary Edition with Commander Shepard herself, Jennifer Hale. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope it's filled with entertainment, nerdery, interessante-ness. Stay tuned for an episode of the facility this week. This week we are talking about, um, oh, something that Einstein thought up over a hundred years ago about how to talk to the past. Until then, as I said, have a wonderful rest of your week. Let me know if you figure out how to get off of this elevator, because I'm not super sure, and be nice to each other, because this is all we got. I guess I'll I guess I'll just jump off. Yeah.